For more on this and what's been happening with these escalating Middle East tensions, let's bring in Kareem Sajapur. He's Carnegie Endowment Senior Fellow. And Kareem, it's great to see you today. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. We know that things have been escalating. Been watching what happens. How do you think this all plays out? Well, as we see, uh, we've seen in the past with major events in the Middle East, it will take years to really measure the impact. But I think there's two certainly short term strategic implications. Number one is that the nuclear deal with Iran is all but dead. President Trump had hoped to get a better deal with Iran and, and perhaps even have a summit with Iranian leaders along the lines of what he's had with Kim Jong Un. Uh, that is 100 percent dead. It's not going to happen. Um, the second strategic implication is that President Trump had hoped to get out of the Middle East and reduce America's footprint in the Middle East. Um, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani is going to necessitate an even greater U.S. presence in the Middle East uh, to protect uh, very vulnerable allies like the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Israel, from Iranian retribution. So in some ways, this move by Trump was inimical to the strategic objectives he had in mind. You know, you had a recent publication. It was called Ayatollah Machiavelli, how Ali Khamenei became the most powerful man in the Middle East. Is he still today? I still think that Iran's supreme leader is the most powerful man in the Middle East. And, and what I said about him is that, you know, he had a, 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 a sword in Qasem Soleimani uh, that allowed him to project power throughout the region. One of the things which is commonly misunderstood about um, regional dynamics is the fact that, you know, Iran is a, is a Shiite country and nearly all Shiite extremists from India to Lebanon are willing to go out there and fight and kill for the Islamic Republic of Iran. But if you look at Sunni countries like Saudi Arabia, almost all Sunni extremist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda want to overthrow the government of Saudi Arabia. So the huge advantage that Iran has over all of its regional adversaries is that it's the only country in the region which can really uh, harness religious extremism in its favor. What about Iraq and the vote in their parliament to uh, try and force the United States out? How, how do you think that plays out? Well, I know a lot of these senior uh, Iraqi politicians, and they're in a terrible spot because privately they don't want the United States to leave Iraq. They realize that uh, it's far uh, better for Iraq's future economically, politically, to be uh, uh, allied with the United States, and they view uh, the United States as a key uh, ally in the fight against Sunni extremists like ISIS. But <coughs> Iran is their neighbor, and during times like this, um, Iran is able to mobilize forces in Iraq in a way that the United States isn't, because America no longer wants to send, you know, thousands of its son and sons and daughters to serve in Iraq. So I think Iraqi politicians are. In, a, in, a, in an, an impossible position, but I know privately they don't want to sever all ties with the United States. How does Iran's Khamenei respond to this? What, what is he kind of measuring at this point in terms of the way to retaliate without bringing the full force of the United States down on his head? Well, I think you, you framed it well, which is he has to very carefully calibrate his response. This was such a momentous event for Iran that he has to respond in a way which is pretty forceful or else they, or else they risk losing face. But with the erraticness of Donald Trump, I think they also have to be careful how they respond. My, my sense, looking at the last 40 years of Iranian history, is that they you know, generally ascribe to that old... Uh, old adage that revenge is a, is, a, is a dish best served cold, that there's going to be a series of proxy attacks on, on the United States and U.S. allies um, over the course of the next many months. And it's not just going to be in the Middle East, but perhaps throughout the world. Why would that not provoke a response from the United States, given what Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo have been saying? You know, one of the things which Iran has managed to do quite effectively over the years is, is uh, operate via proxy. And these days, their proxies are using drones, so it adds another layer of deniability. And so I think if there's an incident somewhere in, in Asia, in Africa, uh, even, even if it's an attack on, uh, on a neighboring country, a place like the United Arab Emirates, and it's coming from the Houthis in Yemen who use a drone, um, I, I think President Trump is going to be himself in a very difficult position in the year 2020 because on one hand, 
If he doesn't respond to Iranian provocations, he looks weak. On the other hand, I think President Trump has said publicly that his base doesn't want another conflict in the Middle East, and he, he's fearful that his base could abandon him if he starts another war in the Middle East. And so I think the Iranian regime is very motivated to make Donald Trump a one-term president. They feel like they made Jimmy Carter a one-term president with the Iranian hostage crisis of 1979, and I think they're going to try to put Trump in a very similar Korean, bind. If that was the case, what would they have to do, though? To because do what? I'm sorry? What would they have to do? I, I mean, to the extent that, that you... Taking notes? I'm not taking notes, Joe. Okay. I'm asking because... I think so, Jimmy Carter had a lot to do with his own uh, uh, on re-election. A, a, uh, a misery index of 26 didn't help, Kareem. Well, the, the hostage crisis, which was a daily humiliation of the United States that lasted 444 days, which was broadcast on a nightly basis, and I our, think... our helicopters it. crashed into each other when we tried to, to uh, free the hostages, too. Exactly. It was humiliating. But, but let me set up kind of a, 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 a plausible possibility, which is uh, a, a, a drone from Yemen, from Iran's proxy in Yemen, the Houthis, hits the airport of Dubai, which is one of the busiest airports in the entire world now, uh, a key hub of global commerce for, for, for Asia, for the Middle East, for Africa, for parts of Europe. You know, how does the United States respond in that instance? Uh, I, I think many regional allies are concerned that Trump is not going to stick his neck out for them.